Hey everybody, welcome back to Black Magic Craft. Let's say you want to run a cool jungle themed adventure for you and your friends, or maybe you and a buddy want to battle lizard people against a robot army. Buying appropriate terrain could be really expensive. So in this video, I'm going to show you how I turned this simple foam block into this modular jungle temple terrain. You'll be surprised just how simple it was and how cheap. I even broke out the Mod Podge and the regular old craft paint for this one. Like I said, this build is made from XPS foam. This is the same foam that I've been using a lot of lately, and it's the one that I'll be helping to bring to market in lots of useful thicknesses for crafters. That'll be happening really soon, I promise. I made a brick of foam and laid out a pattern. Something with square geometric kind of shapes because, well, to me, I think of Mesoamerican architecture this way. It's just where my brain goes. Obviously, I'm not making any sort of historically accurate Mayan or Aztec ruins here. Don't at me, bro. I'm just trying to capture a bit of a vibe and use that style as inspiration. In the end, this is going to go with some chameleon lizard people who will fight barbarians and wizards. This isn't real life. The basic idea going into this build was to make one interesting shape cut it out of a block of foam so that it could then be sliced to quickly create multiple copies of the same shape. You definitely don't need a hot wire cutter to make terrain out of foam, but it sure makes doing tasks like this a lot easier with much cleaner results. This is a very simple process. The hardest part is maintaining your patience while cutting out the shape to make sure you don't overcut and make sure you keep all the lines relatively straight. Once you have your basic shape cut out, you can pick a thickness and slice it into individual layers. Keep in mind this technique could be applied to all sorts of shapes and patterns. If you want to do a really elaborate design but don't want to have to lay it out over and over again and cut it out multiple times, consider going with the block and slice route. Or as I like to think of it, the loaf of bread technique. While the outline of the pieces were kind of cool, they were still very plain. They needed some carving to give them an interesting pattern and a bit of depth. I grabbed a coffee stir stick and used that as a gauge rather than trying to measure out all the same border a hundred times. This was a quick option that allowed me to do it without paying much attention. And when you're doing repetitive work like this, it's good when it doesn't require too much focus so that you can alleviate some of the monotony of doing a repetitive task by watching or listening to something else entertaining at the same time. On my first one, I cut in the outline that I had traced out and played around with a few different methods of getting some relief cuts. At first I did the press down method along these cuts the same way I've done in the past for timber and plaster walls but I didn't think this looked quite right. So I moved to a more aggressive approach, cutting out some of the foam to make grooves that would leave the middle of the patterns raised. This definitely looked better, but I still wasn't totally happy with it. On my second go, I changed the layout of the cut slightly and was a lot more precise with my grooves. This produced a way cleaner result. The nice thing is that I was making a set of ruins. So I was still able to use my first one. I didn't care if it didn't exactly match all the other ones. It was really important to use a fresh, sharp blade for this task to avoid ripping the foam. Another important detail was to slightly and irregularly bevel all the edges. This would help to make it all look like carved stone instead of foam. These pieces would make great headers but they needed some appropriate pillars to stand on. I made them by first cutting some square stock strips out of foam and cut them all to the same length, which I think was four inches. The base of these pillars were the size that I wanted, but the thinner header pieces would look strange sitting on top of them. I needed to keep the bases thick while making the tops match the thickness of the header pieces. The simplest way to achieve this would be to cut two sides at an angle, to make more triangular pillars. Cutting off one side was an easy affair. I just had to adjust my wire to the appropriate angle and slice it. It got more difficult when trying to do the other side though, as I could no longer stabilize the uh, side up against the rip fence and trying to keep it plumb while cutting would be nearly impossible. Thankfully, my brain was working and I thought to save the cutoff of the first side so I could just flip the whole piece around and maintain a stable contact on the fence using the wedge of waste material, which was pretty smart. I laid out a simple stone pattern on the pillars to make them look not completely monolithic, and I sped up the layout process by just transferring the marks from one to the rest and freehand cutting the grooves, doing my best to keep things square. After texturing with the stone, I could assemble each one with a dab of hot glue. It occurred to me that having a set of these all the same height would be kind of strange and boring, so I cut down the height of a couple of the pillars uh, to get some variety. 
I like the way these looked, but they sure wouldn't be stable enough to use on their own. They needed bases. I went with foam bases on them so they could be carved to look like part of the stone structure rather than using something like MDF bases with ground cover. I again cut out one master block and sliced it into layers to give me a bunch of matching bases. As is, they would be way too thick and chunky, but I had cut them this thickness so that I would be able to do some rabbit cuts along the edges to make a simple step. This could be done more precisely on the hot wire, but when it doesn't need to be perfect, I actually find it more satisfying to do freehand knife cuts. I didn't necessarily want to add rubble to these bases, as it would add a whole other step of drying time, but I was concerned that the joints between the pillars and the bases would fail pretty easily and wanted to lock them in place better. Some glue and sand were a perfect way to make these joints more secure while also adding to the look. Once that was all dry, I did my Mod Podge and black paint coating. I don't do this very often anymore, instead opting to use a rattle can or airbrush primer. The reason is that these days I rarely build entirely out of foam. I use a more mixed material approach. And the stuff I build these days is often fragile and detailed in a way that Mod Podge can't protect. So I don't bother. But since this was a pure foam build, it made sense to go the old school route here. One thing I don't like about Mod Podge as a primer is that even the matte stuff is pretty glossy, which isn't ideal for painting. So I usually follow it with a quick brush of watered down black paint. This also helps to get in all the little deep crevices of the brickwork and hide more of that foam color. Before I get into painting these, and the fun and messy task of making some vines, let's take a second to check out this video sponsor. One Page Rules are known for making wargaming accessible. They produce approachable games with simple to understand rules, and they offer a variety of miniatures that you can print at home for these and other games. These minis come in a variety of styles that can be used for all sorts of games, either One Page Rules games, proxies for your other favorite war games, or even for your tabletop RPGs. They recently added added a bunch of fun models to their Saurian army. I especially like the Gecko and Chameleons. They are really fun. At first I thought, oh neat, they have like dart guns and they're holding little frog creatures. That's cute. Wait, some of those creatures are strapped to their bodies and they're full of spikes. Oh, they're like little poisonous toads or something. And that's part of their ranged attack. A very cool detail on these minis. The models all come pre-supported and can be obtained through the One Page Rules Patreon. It's a great bargain. You get a ton of models for a really low price. I highly encourage you to try them out and also play some of the One Page Rules games. They're streamlined and straightforward. A great place to start wargaming, but also a good option for longtime players tired of being bogged down by cumbersome rules. I'll put a link in the description so you can check them out for yourself. Now I went old school BMC with this paint job. No airbrush, no inks, just the classic dark to light craft paint approach. Rather than a set of grays, however, I worked with browns and beiges. This style of painting terrain is so easy, uh, anyone can do it in just about any setting. It's a great option for kitchen table crafters. And in the end, it looks pretty darn good. I have to admit though, after doing a lot of terrain with the airbrush and inks, I found going back to this method really tedious. I forgot how long it could actually take. I'm sure the entire process ended up taking several times longer than had I sprayed them on with an airbrush, but that's okay. It was a good choice on this set. And if you're new to this hobby, this is something you can jump right into. It's straightforward and very forgiving. And these looked all right and would be perfectly fine for a game night as is, but they could be a bit better. I wanted some jungle roots and vines wrapping around them, but was limited in what I had on hand to make them. I remembered these brown paper bags in the basement and thought I might be able to soak them in glue, twist them up using their brown color to my advantage. I diluted some wood glue with water and added in some ink to tint the paper further. This is a very messy task and it didn't exactly work out as well as I expected. The paper bags didn't want to absorb the water and ink as much as something like paper towel would have. And I gotta wonder if that would have been a better option. The other problem is that they didn't want to stay twisted. But I carried on dunking, squeezing, twisting, and draping, making the best of what I had in front of me. I didn't love the way they were looking, but I was deep in at this point and just wanted to see it through. And I hate giving up. 
Thankfully, the mess that got on the other areas of the structures just looked like moss, so at least I didn't have to worry about keeping things tidy. One thing I was impressed with was just how fast they dried. I was expecting them to take a full day, but they only took a couple hours, and that was awesome. This meant I had a little more time to spare on the project, and I could use that to make the paint job look a little bit better with an oil wash. I have this deep down moss effect paint. It, it's great, but I wanted to try airbrushing it on. The problem is that whatever it's made of dries almost instantly and is pretty gummy and sticky. Not the ideal material to run through an airbrush. It looked good, but it was such a pain in the butt uh, and it resulted in needing a full stripped down cleaning of the airbrush. Overall, this was a fun little set to build. The kind of thing that you could knock out in a weekend while watching some movies. Very little material was used and all the material was cheap and none of it really required much skill. I'm not sure I would say this is like a first day craft or beginner project, but it's pretty close. Maybe second project level. At the same time, it was an interesting enough project to be worthwhile for a veteran crafter. And I'm glad to add it to my collection. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to give it a like and leave a comment below and maybe share it with some friends too. If you want to grab some hobby tools, you can pick up stuff through the links on blackmagiccraft.ca to help this channel while you do your shopping. If you really enjoy these videos I make, the best way you can help me keep making them is by supporting the channel on Patreon. I'd love to have you there. That's it. That's all, folks. Cheers. See you next time.